Hi everyone, it's GigaBeef here, and today we're going to be checking out some of the new weapons mechanics that have been added to EFT, namely weapons malfunctions and overheating. We don't know everything yet about the new system, but I love delving into a new set of mechanics, so let's get going and take a look at how it works. First and foremost, what exactly has changed in 12.12 around weapons mechanics? Malfunctions were in the game last patch, but it was only misfires on rounds themselves, as in the round is a dud so to speak and fails to fire. In the first iteration, the chance of this misfire was related to both the weapon durability and the round. I'm not sure yet if the weapon's durability effect has been moved from the misfires to the actual jams completely, and if a misfire chance is now solely based on the rounds, but it would not be surprising if that was the case given it's really a bullet based mechanic. We now have these three new malfunctions with lovingly detailed information in the patch notes. The first is failure to eject, where a cartridge gets stuck on its way out of the weapon. This is mostly affected by weapon durability, but also by overheating and the cartridge itself. Next we have failure to feed, and this is where the round doesn't make it from the mag into the weapon properly. Whilst mostly based on the magazine, it's also affected by the previous elements, durability, overheating and the cartridge too. Finally we have the jammed bolt malfunction, where the bolt simply gets stuck, and this is both durability and heat related. There are two types of bolt jams, normal and hard, and the only difference is in the time to clear them. With hard jams happening at less than 5% of durability, I don't think you'll ever really see that in regular play unless you're trying to make it happen on purpose. A malfunction plays out using a kind of traffic light system, which is on by default in the settings. This shows up in the bottom right hand corner of your screen as a flashing indicator when a malfunction occurs to quickly let you know that something has gone wrong. This by the way is a very interesting game design choice because this shows immersion over realism. In real life you'd know when your gun had stopped firing when you were holding down the trigger. In game you can't really get that same sense of feedback and so instead there's an indicator on the screen. It's less realistic but it's more immersive for the user. This indicator starts with a red flash which means that there is a problem and it needs investigating or the weapon won't fire anymore. There are two new keys which have been added which are the inspect current weapon and also fix malfunction which has been combined with the old check chamber key. You begin by pressing the inspect weapon key first which will give you an orange flash as the weapon is being investigated to check which malfunction has actually happened. This information appears in the bottom right as well and then you need to press the fix malfunction key afterwards to clear whatever the problem was. After this routine the weapon will be usable again and can continue to fire. I had a little play around with the settings here and similar to the bandage hemostat bleed prioritization key I've talked about previously there is a way to combine this into one key. Use whatever key you want, I've chosen B, and set check chamber fix malfunction to this key and make it on press. Then set inspect current weapon to the same key but make it on release instead. This means you only need one button to do all of the malfunction clearing actions. When there is no problem your key will activate check chamber first and foremost and nothing else because the press action is the first thing that gets activated and takes priority. When there is a malfunction you can't check the chamber in a regular way because the gun is jammed somehow so instead the game does the inspect weapon sequence. Then because you've already uncovered the jam neither check chamber or inspect get activated and instead the unjam sequence begins on the release of the key. The one key we lose out on here is the hold the weapon in front of you and look at it key but you can keep that if you like so long as you bind it elsewhere to another button at the same time. I have it bound to L as well where it used to be given I don't use it very often. Now the new misfire mechanics have also come with a cool quick swap for pistols which allows you to rapidly switch to a sidearm when a problem occurs. You can see this option activate when the traffic light system appears as a flashing slot on the HUD with the pistol telling you that a rapid swap is available. This is very fast compared to a regular weapon switch which you can see in this clip here. With these new malfunctions there are some new metrics that have been added to the game which gives us an idea of what might cause these problems in the first place. Gear that specifically modifies this are unsurprisingly mags for failure to feed and you can see that if you check out a regular magazine, for example this one for the PPSH, it has a very low chance to cause failure to feed. On the other hand the drum mag has a high failure to feed chance which reflects Battlestate's desire to nerf high capacity magazines. Rounds themselves also have the failure to feed stat and they have the misfire chance as they did in the last patch and also a brand new stat which is called heat. Heating and cooling has been introduced in 12.12 and the patch notes did a pretty thorough job of explaining to what degree this has an effect on our weapon. There are four stages, slight, medium, severe and maximum. Slight means that the barrel will show the mirage effect or heat haze from the weapon due to its temperature. There is no visible reddening but the barrel, muzzle and handguard will now be visible on thermal scopes which I think is pretty cool despite having limited in-game usage given you can already pick players out fairly easily with the thermal, it's just a nice touch. 
Medium heating means a visibly reddened barrel. This results in lower accuracy, a higher malfunction chance, and the wear to the weapon increases if you do continue to fire. And quite importantly, you not only do damage to the weapon durability itself, but you also start to do damage to its max durability too. I took a scav grade AK in for testing, and after a few magazines ran it from 58.9 out of 66, down to 49.9 out of 55 by firing it continuously. In another test, a 100% durability ADAR firing 10 magazines of M855 went to 71.8 out of 72, being run as hard as possible. Firing the same amount in a controlled manner resulted in a final durability of 84.9 out of 100. This is a massive difference. Severe overheating is the next stage, which as well as those effects from the medium heat state includes rate of fire changes, as well as the possible chance of cooking off. This is when a round can just go off inside the weapon because it's so hot that the primer ignites, and I had this a few times whilst testing. It looks like we're going to have to actually show some discipline after a big fight around our teammates, and I'll definitely be waiting for the funny clips to come rolling in from this one. Finally, we have maximum overheating when the weapon hits a certain threshold of heat and a bolt jam malfunction occurs. We said before that rounds themselves have a heating stat to them, but many components around the barrel also affect overheating as well now. Gas blocks and tubes, uppers, muzzles, handguards and the barrels themselves have two new stats, heat, which we saw already, but also cooling too. Why are there two elements for the same thing? Well, the overheating mechanic can be thought about in two parts. The weapon will start in some default state, presumably zero on the overheating scale. When you fire, a base heating amount is combined with all the positive and negative heat buffs and debuffs you have across your attachments, and for that round being fired. This adds to the heat level of the weapon every time you pull the trigger. Acting to counter this effect over time, cooling will reduce the heat of the weapon, again combining some default amount with the cooling mods across the gun. It appears to take around 20 seconds to go from max heating to cool on a stock AK-74M, but I would expect each weapon to have its own base cooling rate. With the mods, it seems that the bigger and bulkier the attachment is, and without cooling design into it such as wooden handguards, the more they increase the rate of heating and decrease the rate of cooling. Far too fast and the cooling rate will be too slow to cause the weapon to reduce its heat fast enough, meaning the weapon will heat up. I'll be interested to see what the maximum rates of either heating or cooling are across the attachments once everything is investigated, to see whether this can be another element to allow non-meta builds to be used in more prolonged full auto than meta builds, giving the player another choice to make when putting their loadouts together. There is a lot more to explore in this area, and we're just getting started. So if you did learn something and enjoyed today's video and want to support the channel, then please consider dropping a like and a sub to help me with visibility on YouTube. To see when I'm streaming, you can follow me on Twitter and Twitch, where I'm currently live twice a week, once on Friday at 9pm UK time for the Scav Talk podcast, which you can check out in the description below, and a regular Tarkov stream on Saturday at 2pm UK time. And with all that said, I'll see you next time, and as always, have fun in your raids.